Now, the really the first king of Mesopotamia was one uh, Sargon the first, the one that we call Sargon the first, and uh, his native town was Akkad. And as I said, we don't really know where Akkad is. Presumably, it's somewhere near Babylon. But um, he was a warrior king. He was the first to unite all this area into sort of one miniature empire, united, united kingdom, we shall say. And uh, as you see, he uh, went northward as far as the mountains and then east uh, towards the Mediterranean, down to the Gulf. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a very significant achievement, what we have from his time is this tremendous bronze head. It's about a foot tall and um, uh, it's done in, um, in a hollow wax technique which will develop uh, later uh, to a greater extent but already presents us with a spectacular example. Uh, the beard is long again, the, uh, the hair is plaited. It's done with spectacular skill, the combination of naturalism and, um, uh, and abstraction. The, uh, the beard is beautifully dressed in uh, very symmetrical. Clearly, after Akkad uh, fell, this, this head was, um, uh, was vandalized because the eyes, again, the eyes would be shell and, uh, and, and some semi-precious stone. And uh, the ears were cut off, uh, one eye was just mutilated altogether. So that was intentional, intentional damage, sort of uh, something that we'll, we'll meet with later that will be called damnation memoriae uh, with the Romans, the damning of memory. But as a piece of, as an object of art, it is quite tremendous because it, it, it First of all, it's, it's full of dignity and it's full of fearlessness and um, uh, full of uh, uh, kingly valor. Uh, the uh, aquiline profile conveys uh, forwardness and forceful, forcefulness. At the same time, the lips are extremely sensual. So the combination of this incredible masculinity with, with considerable sexuality of course, right there, uh, projects a tremendous skill in the artist who could convey it. Now, the hair, as you see, the hair is cut, is uh, is gathered in a bun, in the um, at the neck, but it is beautifully plated, and then these lozenges and and uh, triangles uh, uh, of uh, the hair, the hair itself is very very skill skill skillfully done. And yet, despite uh, uh, this, this tremendous skillfulness with uh, artistic conventions, uh, the naturalism is projected really very, very forcibly. And even despite mutilation, the eyes, the ears, uh, also the beard was cut off, the beard was originally longer. It really is an extremely interesting uh, piece of art. Now, with, uh, with him, pretty much, we leave the third millennium and uh, well, we're still uh, well. No, we still go to uh, to Lagash. Not quite yet. Uh, Akkad is here. Here's Lagash. We're still in the third millennium. I mean, ultimately, it's still the same. It's not the same. The different political systems, but the culture underlying it all is uh, still quite similar. So, um, with time, Akkad was uh, replaced with various uh, other forms. And then ultimately, one uh, Gudea came uh, came to the throne of um, uh, well, Babylon, and uh, and ruled for well quite a while. Uh, he was called pious Gudea because he never assumed upon himself any of the military valor or ambitions, for that matter, of uh, Sargon. And uh, his purpose really was to build as many temples or uh, restore as many temples as possible in, um, in the territory of, um, of Babylon. And uh, uh, we have a number of, of 
these uh, statues, whether standing or sitting, uh, very many of them are in the Louvre because uh, the French did the excavations there. And uh, we see him here. It's again, it's a votive uh, figurine, and as you see, it's in diorite. It's, it's it's in stone, so the stone was clearly brought at, at great ex uh, expense. And uh, here he stands, and he is holding a fountainhead from which two rivers emerge. Clearly, uh, Euphrates and Tigris are uh, right there. His eyes are gone. again very. Very large, he is clean shaven, as a priest perhaps would be, instead of a crown or, or a wreath or anything. He is actually wearing this uh, lamb's hat. And um, uh, the writing, the cuneiform on his body, th those are all uh, prayers to various gods and, uh, and um, uh, expressions of worship. And same here, here he sits. And you can see the tension both in the feet and the hands that the, uh, uh, that the artists conveyed. And on his uh, lap and around, around his um, cloth, they're all <coughs> continuous, expression, uh, uh, continuous expressions, worshipful expressions, but also a plan of a temple. Right here, he is holding a plan of a temple. Now, it is a monolith, it's not made of different parts, it's cut out of one stone, as, uh, uh, as you see. Uh, and then, now we are in the second millennium. As I said, the uh, rulers uh, replaced uh, one another, but, uh, but there was always this continuous tendency towards greater and greater unity and greater and greater uh, centralization. So the very first code of law also comes from Mesopotamia and it's called the Law Code of Hammurabi and this is a tremendously uh, famous, it's called Stella, S-T-E-L-E -E, or uh, a pillar, a stone pillar and uh, what you have around is cuneiform describing uh, multiple laws that, that Hammurabi will be the, the, the next uh, significant ruler in the area, will um, codify and bring together from different, various different cities. And um, on the top of the platform, you see Hammurabi himself, who is wearing the same hat as Gudea, right there. He is standing in front of the god Shamash. And the god, as you see, is sitting on, he is on the mountain, because these, uh, these uh, little arches, they designate a mountain. He is sitting in a great throne, and the god clearly is much, much taller than, uh, Sh uh, Shamash is much, much taller than, uh, than Hammurabi, because if only the god stood up, as you can imagine, he'd be twice as tall. But as it is, they in fact looking each other straight into the eyes, and what it shows is that is that the laws that are written on the stella were given to um, Hammurabi by the god. So it was not that, that Hammurabi himself came up with them. These are divinely ordained and therefore they must be obeyed. What's fascinating about this image right here is that uh, the eyes, we will see many representations where even though the head is represented in profile, the eye would be represented as frontal. This is one of the first representations when the eye, in fact, is in profile and the eye looks straight. The eyes look straight at one another. And Shamash is uh, giving him a ring and a staff as the measure of power. Uh, please pay attention to the uh, crown that Shamash is wearing. It's a horned crown, which was very... Uh, common among royalty in uh, Mesopotamia and will be later on. This this has one, two, three, four horns on our side, so figure eight horns. And the more horns, of course, the more important um, the person. And uh, the Code of Hammurabi is longest uh, surviving text from the Babylonian period. And it's been seen as an early example of fundamental law regulating a government sort of an early constitution 
and one of the earliest examples uh, of the idea of the presumption of innocence, which of course was very, very rare, still is in fact, even though we have it in our code. Uh, it still is, nevertheless, uh, those were harsh laws, uh, cheek for a cheek and an eye for an eye, no question, no question about it. Um, and thus, from there, we are, we are pushing forward, as I said. The important thing to remember, it's still Mesopotamia, the art forms are still very much Sumerian art forms, and uh, I will not be asking you to remember each ruler uh, and his dates, just the, uh, the pieces of art, of course, are important. Uh, now, we are going to Assyria. And uh, now, Assyria is now in the uh, upper regions, or it's no longer in the Euphrates, it's the River Tigris, and it's no longer here at the Delta. Uh, the town of Assur is right there, or Ashur, in the upper, in the uh, upper regions of the Tiger, and this is where the Assyrian uh, nation will uh, originate. The uh, the Assyrians uh, were there from from the end second millennium into, of course, um, into the first millennium. But the uh, the latest period of Assyria is the most remarkable and uh, also the most renowned. Uh, a ziggurat, of course, we always have a ziggurat, and this is a you know, the the reproduction or recreation rather of what the, what the cities may have uh, looked like. And uh, uh, the Ashur Banipal, many of the rulers like to take the name Ashur of that town as part of uh, their names, and thus we have Ashur Banipal here. And then su successive monarchs, uh, Sargon, another Sargon, Ashur Banipal, maintained and founded great palaces, and they were a, they were a warrior nation, and they they did conquer a considerable empire. And wherever they went, uh, their principle was to um, to sh reshuffle the populations. For instance, when they conquered uh, when they conquered um, Israel in uh, around 724 uh, BC, they those are the ten lost tribes of Israel. They brought them back with them, and whoever survived, and assimilated them with the population, which is why why the tribes are lost because they were assimilated. Here is an example of a palace in one of those towns in, in Korsabad from 6th century BC. It's a very, it, as you see, it's a very fortified town. Not only it is fortified, but as you see, the watchtowers are extremely uh, uh, frequent. So in other words, every watchtower has, uh, has soldiers. And so soldiers were everywhere because it was a warrior nation, they obviously were also worried about being conquered. They were, a con they were a conquering nation, they were worried about being conquered. And as we saw with other cities, uh, this, is, this area is the area of the royal palace and, um, and then there's the, uh, uh, there's the ziggurat and uh, the, the, the priestly uh, conclave. Uh, as well, and then around around this fortification, there would be again mud brick houses. Oh, Assyria actually. Well, yeah, the majority would still be mud brick, even though Assyria. Remember, it's the north, and uh, so the climate is cold, and they also have a lot of stone because that's that's the mountains are there. Um, but yes, fortification are fortifications are very much uh, in place. Interestingly, there the, there was just I think in this one was just one entry into the fortress, not more, just one entry, and that entry was guarded by these extraordinary creatures that are called the Lamassu. This is, uh, this is uh, a drawing of the excavations in the 19th century. These are the Lamassu. They are part bull, part eagle, part lion, uh, and of course the face, uh, the face is human, right here. Here you are. Uh, if you go, if you walk on the side of it, it appears to be walking, and you see four legs. If you look at it from the front, you see two legs, so all together, uh, this sculpture has five legs. And uh, uh, it was, again, it was uh, colored, painted in, uh, in various combinations, 
and it's a winged bull with a human face called the Lama Su. And this one is actually in the Louvre. The uh, um, comes from Korsabad. The head holds a cylindrical tiara with horns of power. Now, this one has four horns only, two on each side. Whereas, as you see, our god had four on each side, so eight horns. This one has two on each side. Representation is precedent of, uh, of the tetramorph. Goodness, sounds like something out of Harry Potter. Uh, a combination of man, eagle, bull, and lion depicted in the book of Revelation and which will be represented later in Christian iconography during um, the Middle Ages. If you go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you will find, uh, you will find a room with the Lama Su and you'll be able to see them. And uh, this is the, uh, the Louvre has the Lama Su and, and London, of course, this is, the, this is a, a drawing of a delivery of Lama Su from Koshabad to, um, to the London British Museum and, of course, the Metropolitan of Art has them as well. They were tremendous creatures and um, as, I saw, the Assyri as I said, the Assyrians were a conquering nation and when they received guests, they wanted those guests to be impressed and not only impressed but intimidated. And these Lama Su certainly did the trick. Another thing that also did the trick are various low reliefs on the processional way as one walked into the palace, as one walked into uh, the uh, throne room. On each side there would be reliefs. Um, hopefully you'll see, uh, I mean, the, uh, the here's the original thing that is in the um, thing in the British Museum, but I don't know if you see this one better or this, uh, usually black and white, you can see better. Now, uh, this shows the Assyrian archers who are pursuing the enemies. The enemies are swimming across the river. One, in fact, has an arrow, the one who is actually swimming, has an arrow in his back, right there, and swimming, and swimming as fast as he can. The other two obviously cannot swim. As a result, what they have are um, inflated, uh, inflated pig skins or goat skins, animal skins, and that's how they're swimming as well. From the artistic point of view, again, we have this twisted perspective of sorts because, as you see, the river is shown from on high, the swimmers and the archers and uh, the tower people, they are shown from the side. Now, the fortification is seen as if it's in the middle of the river. Obviously, it's not. It's probably uh, some way off. But, well, that's what archers did. They, uh, it's uh, artistic lessons that the, the most important thing was information to show what happened. And as a result, people are of completely different sizes. There's, uh, uh, there's no uh, logical uh, uh, ratio to, uh, uh, to the people. And uh, so these are enormous while the other ones are very small. Uh, and even the, uh, the archers on the left, uh, when you get your PowerPoints, uh, look carefully and you'll see that the, um, the arch strings are in fact behind their left arm, and the, uh, but the bows are in front. So obviously they, they wouldn't be very successful in shooting these, uh, these arrows, but it serves the purpose of great narration. So this is a narrative relief. Now relief uh, means that... Uh, Wait, I, just to explain to me what you mean, because I see the string. Yes, but the strings are... Hold on. I see the front string, it's right there. The front string is here, but then... Huh, hold on a second. Oh, yes, it is. No, but, in the, but over there, so this string is here, but then the string disappears behind their heads. Oh. So they kind of shoot. It would be very. Uh, it would not be possible. But I see the string. Here's the string. No, yeah. you don't see over there. It comes from. Oh, I from, see. I see. From the top of the. Here's and you see this strings. This string comes from below the arm. Okay. Well, no, but that's that the belongs next guy. to the, uh, the yeah, that the belongs to the other guy. So one string below is in the front, but then the other is kind of below the head. Got it. It's 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 very awkward. Here is another scene where uh, Assyrians are always at war, and when they are not at war, 
they're hunting wild animals. And here you see the king who is uh, in the middle of hunting while he's now all of these animals are killed by the king. Only a king can kill the lions. Uh, the but unexpectedly one of the lions jumps forward and then uh, but then there are people in the chariot who are of course uh, who are protecting the king and uh, so the poor lion uh, gets murdered. Uh, this is a painting by a Briton Revere uh, of uh, about, which, which essentially shows the same picture in this. This is one of the most extraordinary uh, images in, in art history ever and it is absolutely no question that whoever drew this image did not have our sensibilities. I mean we have modern sensibilities and uh, we are immediately of course uh, on the side of the lioness and we feel pathos, we feel horror, uh, her hind legs are parallel, uh, uh, excuse me, her hind legs are paralyzed and, uh, and uh, she's essentially dragging her intestines behind her, yet her front paws refuse to give up. She is uh, pierced with, uh, with more lances than, uh, than necessary. The blood is pouring. You can imagine all of this was, was painted. But we can be pretty, pretty certain that that was not the purpose of uh, those who created the image. Because but they the still convey it. They still convey it. I mean, they managed to go. But it was just there. It seems that their ability to convey naturalism was extraordinary. I don't know if it, if they really felt it because it was a very it was a cruel society. It wouldn't have been like an act of rebellion to I don't think still so. show I don't think remorse so. for the creatures. I that think are on the contrary, killed. I think what it shows is to those that visited the king and to those that saw that saw uh, these reliefs is uh, beware. Beware. I see. Yeah, and reliefs. I was. I, I began to talk about reliefs. Reliefs, as opposed to sculpture in the round. Anything can be a sculpture in the round. This is a sculpture in the round, for instance, because you can just walk around it. A relief, on the other hand, is uh, is something that's still attached to the wall, but projected from it. And depending how much it's projected from the wall, I mean, my finger here is a relief, but if I bent it, it's not as projected as before. So it's a low relief, whereas here it's a high relief. So these are reliefs. These are not uh, sculptures in the round, and we'll talk more about it when we talked about when we talk about Egypt. Um, here is a similar picture of a lion, as you see, he does here with his mane what the artist with Sargon did with Sargon's beard. It's very stylized. It's very beautifully symmetrical, but the naturalism is entirely displayed. And here's the lion that again pierced with far too many arrows, and he is. Is throwing up. Oh God! I know it's amazing. It's amazing, yeah. Uh, and here is a painting by an American artist. It's called the Die Version of an Assyrian King. Uh, now all the either war or uh, big game hunting were considered the uh, the worthy occupation for for a significant male. But the lines were, were penned in, it's not like... Exactly, the lines were penned it's in. It's not exactly it, no, a fight no, of equals. No. Mm -mm. And he has all his servants not, around him. It's not in, in, the, in the lion's natural environment. Right. It's not. It, uh, everything is made sure that the king does not die. It's uh, very often the case, unfortunately, with bullfights today as well. Sort of similar. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, yeah, they are let out from the cage. Wow. I know. And then just At least here, it appears that they're in their natural environment, but they rarely were. So it's like fish in the barrel. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are now going to the new Babylon. The new Babylon that is, uh, um, that is the Babylon of um, Jewish captivity. The Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar. These are excavations, reconstruction, because today often archaeologists will attempt to reconstruct the former, uh, the former glory, with uh, with the materials that they find in the um, in the spot. 
and uh, this is the uh, uh, image they showed you before that uh, that shows what ancient Babylon may have looked like and uh, the, the, the glorious uh, glazed tile, glazed the blue tile, they, uh, they had this uh, tremendous gates that were called the gates of Ishtar and also blue tile was used for emphasis uh, around the quarter. Uh, because the Babylonian ziggurat was the tallest, it became the Tower of Babel of uh, the Bible and was uh, very often portrayed, of course, uh, in, in, well, in our own times. And uh, this is Bruegel, uh, this is not quite our own times, it's 16th century, but uh, yeah, in, in medieval manuscripts it was also often portrayed imaginatively because, of course, neither the medieval uh, illuminators nor Bruegel uh, had been to, to Iraq and uh, knew what it looked like. Or well, by that time they didn't exist anyway. Uh, a recreation of Ishtar gates right here. But the great thing is that one can see them. One can see them in Berlin because with the German, now the Germans did the excavations and uh, they in fact came back and reconstructed the gates. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to show you how they found it. They found it in this uh, condition. So this is the same structure and here it is, there. And you can see the Uroks right there. They, the Germans brought back all those bricks because it's still it's still bricks even now glazed bricks they brought them all back here they are in vats and then right here the German archaeologists and scholars reconstructed reconstructed this gate from what you had just seen now granted only the first layer is authentic the the, the first strata Everything else was actually done anew, but the bricks were fired with, with the exact same technique as, uh, as uh, was done in Babylon. And then the animals, now this is the line of, uh, of Ishtar. Ishtar was the goddess of fertility. And this is the line of uh, Ishtar right here. Now every, every little brick that composes the lion was also molded to shape was not flat, it was molded to shape and then put together. Uh, here you can see it better, right here. And this is the Uruk who, of Marduk I think, was another god, right there. And there was also a dragon. So that's quite tremendous. And now we've arrived at our last and biggest empire. We're going here, we're going to Persia, today's Iran. And uh, still Mesopotamia, well, Persia will eat up Mesopotamia and Palestine and Egypt. Uh, we already looked, remember, in Sumer, we looked at these little figures. We are now about to look at this return and this inscription. To Persia we go. Uh, on the Iranian plateau for, for many <laughs> centuries, there were many tribes. And then ultimately, by the 7th century BC or so, the Medians conquered pretty much all these areas except the Babylon. And they also conquered Persia. Persia was a small, well, relatively small, small um, land around uh, Pasar Gadai, right here, where they will later establish Persepolis. The, their great ceremonial capital. In fact, uh, the Persians will have several capitals because the, uh, because the extent of their lands will be so tremendous uh, that one just will not do. But they'll use Agbatana right here and Susa here and of course Babylon in addition to, um, to Persepolis. And um, they, will not be, they, they did not call themselves Persians, they called themselves the Achaemenids because the, uh, the family of Cyrus the Great, who will be the great conqueror, um, he, uh, his, uh, his ancestor was one Achaemenid and it's from him that the name will be known. Um, Persia, the name of Persia, 
uh, well, the Greeks will call it as such because this this uh, bit here yeah, was called uh, Persus by the Greeks. And then later on uh, in uh, Greek mythology, uh, a story will be told about um, uh, about a hero, Perseus, who, um, who went east and there founded the lands of, uh, of Persia. Uh, here. Ultimately, as you see, all of this will be Persia. Everything you see here and a great road will be built from Susa to Sardis, right there, which is called, which was called the Great uh, Royal Road. And uh, he, here's our capitals. There is Persepolis and Pasargadai, right there, which is kind of almost the same city. And Persepolis will be a ceremonial capital. And then there's Susa, Babylonia, and Agbatana. The... Um, here you can see it, uh, Agbatana would be a summer capital, as you see here, Susa, a winter capital, as I said, Persepolis, a ceremonial capital, but Babylon will be sort of a working capital. And uh, interestingly enough, um, interestingly enough, there was, um, uh, historically, there was a notion that um, that one's domains cannot exceed more than um, two weeks travel by horse, because more than that it just becomes uh, impossible to manage. However, beginning with Cyrus the Great, and here he is, um, who conquered all these lands. I mean, he conquered uh, the Babylonians. Remember, uh, conquered the Assyrians. Now he conquered the Babylonians and Asia Minor, then his son will also uh, conquer Egypt, and the, uh, uh, they call themselves kings of the world, and, uh, and with good reason. I mean, this, was, this was the most uh, tremendous empire the world had ever seen. And as I said, um, two weeks, two weeks by horse. However, um, what Cyrus will do, well, for one thing, he will greatly improve and rebuild the royal road right there. And now, remember what the Romans will do later on. The first thing they did was build roads. Because the moment you build a very, a very um, good and solid road, uh, the uh, travel becomes much faster. And uh, this what will happen here as well. Cyrus himself was really an extraordinary man. He was, um, uh, he was a very tolerant man. And the way he, once he conquered his, um, these lands, he pretty much left uh, the native tribes to their own gods and to their own customs. He established a system of satrapies. He divided the whole, all, the whole empire into satrapies, into states. At the head of each state, he placed a satrap. And sometimes these satraps did come from native population, not just from those uh, uh, whom he knew and grew up with in Persis itself. And, now, and the satraps now were directly answerable to Cyrus himself. And, um, and he established a very, well, a humane uh, guiding of his empire. The thing about the Persians is that we, we know most about them from the Greeks, who uh, now the Persians invaded Greece. The Greeks repelled them. We'll talk about, we'll talk about Persians again when we talk about the Greeks. So, as you can imagine, they were not friends, and the Greeks were very bitter toward Persians and didn't have much good to say about that. However, with um, uh, further research and uh, in the 20th, 21st century, um, it's, uh, it's become clearer and clearer that it was quite an extraordinary uh, entity, that Persian Empire. The idea of satrapies they actually inherited from the Assyrians. 
because the Assyrians were the first to divide their lands into satrapies. But the Assyrians guided them um, by sword. Persians, with the system that they established and uh, with the, all the freedoms that they had allowed native populations, didn't have to. The Assyrians, their method was in fact dislocate the native populations and relocate them to Assyrian lands so that they would disappear, which is what happened to the ten lost tribes of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, in other words, they were conquered by the Assyrians, they were dislocated, um, whoever was left, of course, uh, after the conquest, and then they were simply lost among other, other people. Um, Cyrus did not do that. Cyrus left people to, uh, left them to themselves. He placed a satrap, usually one of his own, um, to rule the lands, but that satrap exercised that same tolerant attitude as, um, as had Cyrus the Great. Uh, let's see, oh, there's that maxim about the two weeks by horse. But as I said, they, um, they uh, incorporate the variety of ideas. Well, first of all, the roads. The roads immediately increase uh, your speed right there. And then utilize, uh, they utilized the cavalry uh, and they had fresh supply of horses at every, uh, uh, at every station that, that was needed. And then second, they rebuilt and expanded the royal road, as I said. Um, so instead of limiting expansion, they made it so that two weeks of horse travel would cover a much greater distance. And, well, the system of, um, of satrapies, as I said. And here is presumably one of Cyrus the Great's pronouncements. Success should always call for showing greater kindness, generosity, and justice. Only people lost in the darkness treat it as an occasion for greater greed. And, um, you know, it, it, it seems that he could have said it easily but by, by his actions. We know very much about Cyrus the Great from this incredible, from this great cylinder that lives in the British Museum today. And it's called the Cylinder of uh, Cyrus the Great. It is in clay. Uh, and as I said, it comes, it came to, it was uh, unearthed in Babylon and um, it now lives in the British Museum. Now these cylinders would be, would be rolled on, say, wet clay and thus imprint uh, the impression. Here's what it actually looks like. If you want, if when the impression was taken, this is what it looks like. And, and then we'll talk a bit how 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 one learned how to read uh, these um, these cuneiforms. The uh, uh, in this cylinder, the uh, Babylonian king Nabonidus is condemned, in fact, for his unenlightened uh, rule, and Cyrus, of course, is praised for um, for his enlightened conduct. And uh, it is proclaimed that he is favored uh, with the gods. And it also documents his uh, humane policy, his improvement of the lives of others, and particularly the Jews, because uh, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar um, captured the southern kingdom now of Judea and brought the Jews to Babylon. And uh, he, uh, he expelled them from. Jerusalem burnt, burnt the, the temple of Jerusalem and brought them to Babylon. However, uh, about 70 years later, Cyrus will capture Mesopotamia, he will destroy Babylon, and one of his first uh, proclamations was to return, to allow the Jewish people to return to Jerusalem, and not only to return there, but he also supplied them with sufficient funds to rebuild the city. So was it to an extent uh, some cylinders like that? Was it the propaganda? Unquestionably, of course. But every, every ruler wants to inform the people of his policies. I mean, and he did not have internet, he did not have newspapers, he did not have computers. So the, it's so was 
was a bit like King Hammurabi with his uh, stella, with his laws that were written on that stella that everyone could read. So, but we are extremely lucky to have this cylinder because it gives us a tremendous amount of information uh, from the uh, perspective of Cyrus rather than from the perspective of later Greeks. Now, how, how did one learn to read those uh, inscrutable um, cuneiform signs? Well, uh, there was found in, uh, in Iran um, by the British, uh, there was found an inscription that is called the Behustan inscription. Now, this is our royal road. This is, e this is Western Persia, as Cyrus and then Darius uh, established it. This is Ekbatana, the, uh, the summer capital, so to speak. This is Babylon. Uh, this is Persepolis, Susa. Right here is uh, Behustan. Now, it is a very rocky uh, promontory. Um, let's see, here it is. And, this is. and the inscription is right there. So imagine climbing there. Uh, it's an equivalent, really, of an Egyptian Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone that is done in three languages, we'll look at it soon enough, uh, which allowed the scholars to decipher uh, the uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs. And uh, this is the Bustan inscription that is also done in, um, in three languages, which, again, allowed the scholars to do so. Um, let's see. Uh, multi-language, uh, uh, now it's authorized, it's authored by Darius the Great sometime between his coronation as king of Persian Empire in the year 522 and his death in 486. Now he, uh, he was not a, a direct descendant of Cyrus but, uh, but he was uh, a considerably younger contemporary of Cyrus and then he took the throne uh, in time. The, it begins with uh, just brief autobiography of Darius, and then it talks about, of course, his achievements and uh, and his um, his great battles uh, and his um, his great conquests. The um, as I said, here is the inscription right there. As you can imagine, it was very difficult to get to it. Uh, here it is again. As you see, it's very rocky. Right there is the inscription, I mean, this is the, um, the relief, but then all these flat stones have the inscription on them. Here you can see it. There's the relief, and in this relief, uh, you, see, you see Darius right there, who is praying to his god, Ahura Mazda, who will become Zarathustra or Zoroaster, right there, and then before him, are the uh, the prisoners and then behind him his uh, attendants now all these are cuneiform writings now this is this is what it looks like from uh, the writings themselves this is the cliff and uh, and this is a, a humorous depiction because it was when this was found and when this was investigated and um, uh, the whole process of reading the uh, the cuneiform, just as it was with reading of, uh, uh, of Egyptian hieroglyphics, everybody was extremely excited. And in European newspapers, it was con constantly reported. And then in the papers as well, uh, the, um, the humorous descriptions like this were shown as well. In this case, this is Sir Henry Rawlinson, right here who was an officer of the British East India Company. And he is the one who climbed up there. He is the one who took, well, obviously he had help. And uh, there are great chasms between the inscriptions. They managed to jump over. But today, I mean, you know, later, of course, scaffolding was, um, was built up. Uh, but Rawlinson did it at, very much at the, uh, um, at the risk of his life. And... Um, so the inscription includes three versions of the same text, just like Rosetta Stone will. And it is written in three different uh, script languages, 
Old Persian, Elamite, and Babylonian, which was uh, sort of a variety of, um, of Akkadian. And it was the Old Persian, in fact, that um, turned out to be very helpful because it will develop into Middle Persian and then, uh, and then later Persian. And that's what helped uh, the scholars to read uh, the inscription. Here's Darius the Great, proclaimed himself victorious in all battles and attributed his success to the grace of Ahura Mazda, uh, the, the Persian deity. Uh, the Persian religion was the fight between the dark and the light forces, and of course Ahura Mazda represented the light forces, and, uh, this, and, then, and then the prisoners are lined up in front of them, in front of Darius, and one of them, you see, is uh, placed below Darius' feet with, his, with one of his feet on top of the prisoner while the prisoner is uh, praying for delivery, right here. And in fact, Darius' Darius's, uh, hand emphasizes uh, a charity, it seems to be. Uh, now, this just tells you how the old Persian text was copied from here uh, and deciphered before recovery and copying of the Elamite and Babylonian. So first they realized that the Elamite and the Babylonian texts were undecipherable unless they deciphered the Old Persian and that's where they started and they were very right to do so. Um, now, uh, so that's how we learn to, uh, to read the cuneiforms. Um, now about the, per about the art of Persia. To, uh, to some extent, well to a great extent in fact, um, it was derivative, and yet it, it also had very much the integrity of, um, uh, of its own. In fact, um, uh, it's very possible that they were the Babylonian artists who worked for, uh, for, the, for, the, for the satraps and for the kings. And very possibly the Greeks now, because we are in... Uh, uh, in the middle of the 6th century BC when Cyrus the Great began uh, his conquests and that is uh, uh, that, that corresponds to the archaic period in Greek art that was developing at great pace um, and uh, so it's very possible that the artists that the Persians uh, employed were in fact either the Babylonian artists, the Mesopotamian artists or the Greek artists this, for instance, this comes from, uh, from about 500, 500, between 500 and 400 BC, and it's the Riton that we saw in our Mesopotamian, the, uh, the first Mesopotamian slide. And um, it was found in today's Armenia, and that too is in the British Museum. I mean, the British Museum is one of the greatest museums in the world, of course. And uh, it shows the Riton with, with the head of what well, seems to be an eagle with the horns, which, and, and this combination from uh, different animal types was very, was very uh, common in, um, uh, in Persia and in Mesopotamia, in Egypt later on. Uh, now, interestingly, 5,000 years before, here in 5,000 BC in fact, this comes from very, very, very early uh, Iranian uh, art. Uh, I mean, this is uh, this corresponds to some of the oldest uh, artifacts from Egypt, and this too is a beacon, and uh, it reveals a love of animal forms. As I said, um, it is a thin shell of yellow clay, and the design is very simple with very beautiful abstract animal forms, but also linear forms, as you see here. The um, the horns of the mountain goat, Ibex, are depicted with two sweeping cur uh, curves and the racing hounds follow the circumference above here, above the Ibex, also in, in, in very compelling abstract terms. The upper rim design is made up of the flock of birds right there, simply expressed as a vertical and diagonal lines. So nomadic tribes left no structures, but they did bury their dead with portable art in animal motifs, such as weapons, 
bridles, buckles, and fibula. Uh, this kind of art called nomads uh, gear or migration art. It will later be called migration art. Now, here they are together. We still have an animal motif. We still have the, uh, the ibex's uh, different horns, differently expressed. Uh, the, uh, the beak itself is that of a bird. As I said, it's a, it's a combination of birds. But the linear, the linear idea is still preserved very much. So you can see how the tradition continues through, I mean, through millennia. Uh, granted, the, the palmettes, the little palmettes and the floral design up on top of the ibex, that's pretty Greek. That's, that, that points you to a Greek workshop or, or, or a Greek master craftsman, one of them. So it, it, and this is done in silver. Uh, now, as I said, we'll, let's, let's go to Persepolis. We have, uh, again, Batana is summer capital, Susa winter capital, Babylon working capital, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then Persepolis. Let's go to Persepolis. That was a ceremonial capital, and it was spectacular, presumably. It was all color. Uh, the ancients loved color. And here is one of the recreations of, of what it may have looked like. Uh, this is a plan of the great palace that was built not by Cyrus the Great, but by his um, uh, successors. And there are various halls here. This is the great ceremonial stairwell, which still exists in, in, in its ruined state. And this would be a, a sort of a gate, gate, gatekeeping uh, entrance right here. Then the consul hall, 777, this is 5. The consul hall is here, right there. And then the throne hall is now this is the whole of a uh, hundred columns and it's called it, it came to be called as a hypostyle hole and there's no now for that that is completely original for that there is no precedence at all and in fact it's very possible that later Islam in um, when they needed to build uh, spectacular buildings of, the, of their own they in fact adopted it to their mosques so this is the hypostyle hall. Then Apadana, the Apadana is the great uh, uh, is a great consul hall, right here. Also with the columns, palace of Darius, right there. Palace of Xerxes. There's a harem, of course, that have hundreds and hundreds of concubines, and the treasury, right there, with another palace. Uh, of that, this is what's left. Um, unfortunately, we, between, uh, between the fact that Alexander the Great burned the capital in 330 BC and then, of course, the passage of time, this is, um, this is what we have. This is the remnants of the 100 column hall right there. This is what presumably it looked like. Wow. I know, right? It's, it's crazy it, that it was that. Yeah, it was completely destroyed. Considering how what a right, how so how he supposedly loved culture and how even his own Macedonian, Alexander, right? Right. I mean, his own Macedonian troops resented the fact that he was too erudite and that he was not Macedonian enough. Enough, right? He that was, he went native. Yeah, quote unquote, went native as exactly because he he adopted so much Persian culture. Took a, oh, Persian, yeah. took a Persian young man as a lover. I mean, and a young woman as a wife. As a young woman as a wife. Yes. Yeah, he, he, Roxana. Roxana. And um, there's, a, there's a really nice book about it called The Persian Boy. Mm -hmm. I think there's a movie also called either Persepolis or... Well, it's, the, yeah. Either way, it's insane that he then took right. something of such a grace and beauty. and. Well, presumably he did it in revenge for the Persians burning down Athens in the back in the early 6th century uh, BC and uh, so Alexander 200 years later in revenge for that presumably burnt their capital. Well this as I said this is a recreation as you see there's no central axis, axis. there's just the, it's a columnated forest 
and then each column uh, ends with a double bullock as a capital. And each double bullock uh, supports these tremendous beams. The beams go on a rectangular, rectilinear uh, fashion. Uh, here is this, you can see it better here, this is your typical column with a double bullock supporting the beams and this is the actual thing that, uh, that has lost its color but uh, it has been put together, you can see here that it's been glued together from the remnants. Um, the ceremonial nature of uh, Cyrus's court is very much depicted still in, um, in Persepolis and uh, you just see Cyrus's retinue coming and going and uh, now the carving itself was probably done by the Greeks as well because it's just extremely smooth, it's perfect perspective, it's, um, uh, it, it, it's really the, uh, the top of craftsmanship as opposed to uh, sort of just uh, scratching the, the imagery on, um, on the stone. The, uh, uh, the carving is done extremely well. Also there are rows and rows and rows of these uh, of the images of trade that went on these roads, whether the armies went on the roads or trade went or messengers. Uh, it, was, um, it was a very, very well organized kingdom. Uh, one can't take it away from the Persians. And one can see it, in fact, in the imagery. Uh, here is a king, whether Cyrus or Darius. No, it's not. Well, it could be, uh, could be Cyrus as well. It's just that the palace was built considerably later. But that doesn't mean that the imagery could not be of uh, the founder of the empire. So here's a king receiving his satraps with, uh, with their messages, with, the, with their information. And then behind him is his court. Uh, this is, uh, oh, I should have shown it after the plan, but that's okay. Uh, this is, I mean, it, it's a computer, it's a computer recreation of what part of it may have been, together with the whole of the hundred columns. And here's still another recreation of the same, and this, unfortunately, is uh, a painting. Well, the painting was done, uh, this, unfortunately, is the event of the burning of Persepolis by Alexander the Great uh, in 330 Persian capital after looting its enormous treasures. As you can imagine, the, the treasures there were tremendous, just as they were tremendous in Susa and Babylon and the other cities. Um, Persepolis, known in, in antiquity as Parsa, the city, uh, and, then, uh, and then the Greeks gave it the uh, attached polis, so it became Parsa polis the city of the Persians, and that's how we know it. Well, we have now uh, uh, come to the end of, uh, uh, of our lectures on Mesopotamia and beyond, and uh, we all know how it began uh, about uh, 3500 uh, BC and earlier, in fact, in Sumer, and then went on and became a kingdom under um, under the kings of Akkad, then of course Gudea and his beautiful temples, and then Hammurabi, and um, and his uh, code of law jumped to Assyrians in the north, um, then Babylonians again, and finally the Persians. Thank you very much. I will see you next time.